All right, so we are live, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we're all about bringing conservation, nature, and science into classrooms around the world. And today, we are continuing something that we wrapped up about a month ago, which is the SciComm story time. So as you know, if you've been joining us on YouTube or in person on Zoom, we feature cool scientists, explorers, organizations around the globe. But for a month, all brought together by the amazing space gal, Emily Calandrelli, we featured uh, a speaker every single day at 2 p.m. Eastern highlighting their story, how they got into SciComm, some of the amazing things that they get to do in science communication and more. It was a great thrill, lots of really neat people. So today, a friend of mine from here in Toronto, she's joining in. We're going to do a similar sort of talk today. Um, and yes, Evie Velikova is joining us. She is a really wide-ranging science communicator. She hosts a podcast. She's been involved in every kind of science event in the city that you can imagine. Story Collider, Science is a Drag, Ontario Science Center work, and so much more. Um, we are thrilled to have her today, and I'm looking forward to diving in with her talk about her work, uh, why it's so inspiring, what she gets to do, and then taking some questions from you guys at home. Without further ado, thank you so much for joining us today, Evie, and take us away. Thank you so much, Jesse. I'll start by sharing my screen. Uh, there we go. And full screen. And is that good? It's perfect. It wants to work. It's, there you go. Go for it. <laughs> perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for organizing um, all these talks. It's been really exciting for me to hear other people's stories too, um, and all the kinds of exploration people are getting up to. Uh, I wanted to do something a little different today. We're not going to go around the world or to a different part of the world. We're not even going to go to a science center or um, a, an aquarium. We're going to stay right at home. So uh, this is a picture of me. I'm a science communicator, which means that I take the science that a lot of cool researchers are doing and I make it fun and exciting for all of you. Um, and my way of exploring kind of started right at home uh, with my favorite childhood hobby, and that is reading. Oh, I'm gonna click the next slide, reading. So if we were in a room, I would have had you guess like, what do you think my favorite childhood hobby was based on these photos? Um, but as you can tell, it's pretty obvious. Uh, I always had my nose in a book. Like, I'm not even looking at the camera in some of these photos. Um, I was constantly um, had my nose buried in a book. I was reading about space. I was reading about travels. Oh, let's go back to that. There we go. <laughs> I was reading about space. I was reading about travels. Um, I was exploring all around the world and through different time periods and into outer space all through my own home. Um, and the reason I love reading so much was growing up, this was my family. So there's me in the middle with a flower crown and a pink shirt and my parents on my right and my grandma on my left. So I grew up as an only child with three adults in the house. So I clearly had to find a way to have fun and do the kids stuff I wanted to do while the adults wanted to do like adult stuff like cleaning and chores and work. <laughs> so I was finding ways to entertain myself. And a lot of that was through my favorite books. So I have a few of them here. I always love the Harry Potter series. I love the series of unfortunate events. I love the Chronicles of Narnia. Um, and I love reading um, as my way of exploring the world around me because we immigrated to Canada when I was four. So my first few years in Canada, we didn't have tons of money to like travel on a big vacation or go camping or go to a cottage. Um, all these ways that you can explore in real life. So we went on like little local trips uh, to explore. And in the meantime, I explored through books. Um, and so I wanted to introduce you to some of my favorite characters that inspired me to pursue the kind of science and exploration that I wanted to um, dive into. So my favorite character from one of my favorite books was Violet Baudelaire. Um, there's been recently a Netflix series based on uh, the book series that you can watch on Netflix. Uh, but the reason I love Violet so much is she wasn't a regular 14 year old girl. She was an inventor. So uh, she and her siblings, um, their parents died in a tragic fire and they're being chased by this evil Count Olaf. And they get into a lot of really dangerous situations and Violet is able to get them out through her inventions. So here she is creating a grappling hook to get her baby sister out of a cage that's hanging off the roof of a house. In another um, in, an, in another book, the, the Slippery Slope, they're falling off a cliff because the evil Count Olaf has cut their caravan um, and they're going to plunge to their death, but she's able to develop a brake system to save their lives. So she is 
uh, incredibly adventurous and uh, resourceful. And she is essentially like a scientist or an engineer, an inventor. Um, and I was really inspired by her and her um, very kind of like exciting life um, due to the difficult circumstances. Um, but she really was resourceful and she saved her and her sibling lives many times. And whenever she would invent, she would pull her hair out of her face with a ribbon. Um, and I would imitate her too. I would like find ribbons around the house and try and tie my hair with a ribbon. And my mom was like, why don't you just like use a hair tie? And I was like, no, I'm going to be like Violet Bottler. I'm an inventor. Um, and another one of my favorite characters was Annie. So she's like the, the smaller one in each of these books from the Magic Treehouse series. Um, so while her older brother was more of a cautious, uh, like nerdy, um, book loving kind of person like he would read books he would take notes he would do research and he was very cautious like he didn't want to uh, dive into dangerous situations but Annie would jump in head first she would like approach dinosaurs and get into a spaceship that would take them to outer space and she was the one who kind of led them on all these adventures um, you know wouldn't always recommend approaching a dinosaur but uh, her exploration and her adventure got me really excited um, and inspired. So all of these books and all these characters help me see myself as someone who could explore. Even though I was just a kid and I wasn't going to the moon or seeing dinosaurs, I was able to explore from my own house and my own library. So when I got to high school, I had to start choosing what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. You know, the, the big decision in high school when you have to pick your courses and pick what you're going to do after high school. Um, and I followed what I was interested in, which was these stories. Like I didn't have a specific love for science or history or math or, or any of the school subjects, but I just wanted to hear these excite more exciting stories. And that's when I realized that the place where the most exciting stories were was in science class. Um, so it might seem surprising because we think of stories as like English class, um, but science always has a story. Everything that was ever discovered um, was discovered by someone and someone has that story of discovery. Um, so in grade nine, one of my first classes in the morning, the first class I ever took in high school was science class and we learned about the atom. And I'll tell you the story of the atom that we learned in grade nine. We, uh, scientists knew there must be, uh, for centuries they figured there must be something like an atom, right? We're all made up of these tiny building blocks um, but they didn't know what the atom was. So first they thought it was like a ball, just like a ball. And there's a lot of tiny microscopic atoms that make up our body. Uh, but then they did some more research and some scientists found that it's not just a ball. There's a kind of a ball with things floating around in it because they discovered these electrons could kind of jump and move. So the little negatively charged electrons must be suspended in some kind of um, gooey, ooey gooey atom. Uh, so it's kind of like a chocolate chip cookie. Uh, so scientists went from it's a ball to it's a chocolate chip cookie. And then they went to an atom is like a solar system because there's something in the middle and the electrons aren't floating around like a cookie. They're actually orbiting around it like a solar system. And then scientists did even more research and they said, no, it's not like a solar system. It's actually like a cloud uh, with the center in the middle. And then these electrons are kind of orbiting all around them in these different shapes. Uh, so this is a story. This isn't just, um, we are made of atoms. Here's some math. Here's like how we can calculate it. It came from a story over hundreds of years of scientists trying to figure this out. Uh, so I was very captivated by these stories. And by the end of high school, this is me in my high school biology class. Um, we all love our textbook, clearly our biology textbook. Um, but I was most fascinated by the stories of cells and atoms and DNA and um, like how animals evolved to be the way they are today. And that was what captivated me most. So I stuck to what I love most, which was stories and reading. And this is where it led me. It actually led me to pursue science. Um, so I started university in a general science program where I was studying biology, chemistry, physics, all the different sciences. Um, and I had to pick where to go from there because um, in my university, uh, you could choose which specific kind of science you wanted to go into. And so I pursued the next story that I, I read that captivated me more than anything else. And this was a book called The Brain That Changes Itself. And um, so this book, Jesse's Nodding, like maybe you've, maybe you've heard of it. It's a bit of an older book now. It's 2007. So it's been out for over 10 years, but it is so fascinating. Um, the idea of this book is that 
we know our body goes through changes. Like we know that our hair grows. And so when we cut it, there like new hair is growing out the root or we knew, we know we can lose skin cells. Like if we take a shower and then like rub our arm, there's like skin cells falling off. Um, so we know that our skin can, can regrow or if our bones break, we know that our bones can heal themselves. Uh, but for many years, scientists didn't think the brain did that. They thought when you reached adulthood, your brain is done. Like it's, it's grown as much as it can. Um, and it doesn't change. But in fact, this book showed that that's not true. And it told these incredible life-changing stories of how someone couldn't walk or they couldn't move or they couldn't speak or they had a learning disability that made it difficult for them to learn. And everyone told them that they would never be able to do that again, um, whatever their difficulty was. And this book showed that through new therapies and new treatments, um, people who couldn't move a certain limb were able to move it again. And people who couldn't learn due to their learning disability were able to learn again. So it showed that the brain can always change um, even when you're an adult. Uh, and this captivated me so much. And I thought the greatest mystery we have in science that I, I'm seeing right now is the brain. Um, so I went to study just that. So I started my uh, degree in neuroscience and here's me with a sheep brain uh, studying that. And I also studied the human brain and I was so captivated by all that's unknown about the human brain. And there is so much we don't know. Um, a lot of the techniques we have to look at the brain, um, like MRI or x-rays, uh, uh, or these kind of newer techniques, um, like, like MRI or fMRI, where you can actually see the function of the brain and what it's doing in real time, they're pretty new. So it was a very exciting new field. New field. Um, and the more I studied neuroscience, the more I realized that what I love most about my research wasn't the actual research, like being in the lab or being in my Excel spreadsheets, um, but it was sharing it with other people and getting other people excited about it. So I was writing some blogs for a lab where I would uh, take an article that is very complicated science and I would make it really easy to understand for other people. Um, I would give some talks, I would mentor younger students to help them write uh, and learn about neuroscience. And I was realizing that what I loved not, was not just the science, but it was the communicating part. Um, I gave a few talks like I am now um, about things I'm passionate about. And I also met a friend of mine named Anthony Morgan. So you can see here, there's uh, some cool stuff happening. Uh, there's some, there's all these cool things that you can do with science and you could do it in front of a crowd and you can do it uh, in, a, in a book or in a movie and get people excited about it um, rather than just working in the lab. And so Anthony Morgan, he's on the left. Uh, I met him and he told me that he's a science communicator, but that's a thing you can do. You can as your job, go on TV or go to uh, classrooms or write books or create videos. You can do all these things to share science as a real career and a job. And that's when I started uh, getting excited about science communication as a thing I could pursue. And that's where we are now. So I am a science communicator. Um, in addition to doing research, I also uh, give talks and I create videos and I create podcasts to ask researchers what their science is all about and then translate it in a way that uh, people who are not in that field can understand. So that's what science communication is. Um, it can be movies, books, um, and films, and a lot of the books that I was reading as a kid were also science communication and I didn't even know it. So an example I have here is Frankenstein. Frankenstein is one of those things that we all kind of probably know what it is, um, even if we haven't read Mary Shelley's book, Frankenstein. Um, so Frankenstein is, uh, was a book written by Mary Shelley based on the recent science of her time. So it might surprise you, but at the time, electricity had only recently been discovered, like that electricity could flow through a wire. The first battery had just been invented. So people were discovering that you could power things with electricity. And this is all very new. Um, so Mary Shelley yeah, was so fascinated um, by this that she wrote a, a book about what if you could create this monster and then shoot electricity through it and then the monster would come alive. Um, and this was groundbreaking and wild at the time. And so essentially, even though it's fiction, um, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is kind of an early form of science communication because people got to ask questions um, about uh, Frankenstein and about science and we got, she got lots of people thinking about it that had maybe never aren't scientists and never thought about it before. 
And so you might be wondering, this is really cool, Evie, but why is sharing science important? Why is it important that we have science communicators and people who are communicating science? And I think that science communication is the greatest gift we have to solve some of our biggest challenges in the world. Here we have a climate march, and obviously climate change is a big and complicated problem, and we need not just scientists to know what they're doing. Like, I'm sure scientists in the lab are working away, and they are experts in climate change, but we need politicians and students and teachers and TV uh, people. We need all kinds, all hands on deck to tackle climate change. And that's why we need good science communicators to be able to clearly share a message. Another thing that is obviously on our mind is coronavirus. Um, and it's a lot of the uh, words that we use every day now, like coronavirus and social distancing and flatten the curve and antibodies and vaccines. These are words that you might not have thought much about uh, just a few months ago, but now are in our common language. And that's because scientists are informing us to help keep us safe. Um, so science communication for that reason is so important because it can save our lives, it can keep us alive and it can uh, create a healthier, healthier world. Um, so I wanted to wrap it up by giving you a few tips on how you can share science. The exciting thing about science communication is that uh, anyone can be a part of it. Not everyone will be a professional science communicator, but anyone can get excited and get curious about science topics. So the first suggestion I have is to get curious. So I have pictures of rocks here because maybe some of you had a rock collection or have a rock collection. And that's a great way to get curious about the world around you because rocks aren't just rocks. They have history. They tell a history of the earth. So there might be fossils in it or they might be different in different places. Um, so if you get curious, that is one way that you can learn about the world around you. The next thing I want to share is to tell a story. So just like I chase stories, you can chase stories about science and what fascinates you. So here's have the example of here's a topic, snakes. And then the story is why do snakes like to cosplay? I don't know. <laughs> Let's find out. So this is a cool way to instead of just like if you, I tell you to learn science, it might sound boring, like memorize this or like learn this. And that's what a lot of science education sometimes does, unfortunately. Um, but you can get excited about it by following the story instead, um, just like I did when I was a kid. And finally, do what you love, you love. Um, so I love reading books and I love studying the brain, for example, but you don't have to like reading books or studying the brain. Maybe you like music or you like sports or you like history. And these are all ways that we can learn about the world around us. So I'd recommend finding what you love um, and diving into that. And that'll lead you where you gotta go. Uh, so that's it for me. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Fantastic, Edie. Well, thank you so, so much. You did it. Got through the present. Oh. We'll leave that slide up for a minute for anyone on YouTube who wants to check out that social media handle. So Science with Edie, really easy. Uh, so that's fantastic. And then if you want to come out of screen share so we can have a little conversation, that would be awesome. Uh, yeah. For anyone on YouTube, let me know where you're joining from, share questions, and uh, we'll take as many as we can over the next 10 minutes or so. So Edie, my first question for you is, oh, ending screen share, top of your screen, big red button in the middle. Perfect. There you go. Uh, you're back we're here uh is do you have a favorite part of your job i mean you seem to be so enthused about all of this but is there anything that really jumps out that you get to do that you absolutely love i really my favorite thing to do is talk to people in person or or via via zoom person i guess <laughs> um, i think i really love i love writing and i love reading and i love these kind of like um more like you write it and you put it out into the world and it's there. Uh, but I think nothing really beats uh, having people actually get excited in person or via Zoom and have uh, people ask questions. Um, and sometimes it's e that's the easiest way to see the impact you're having because people are like, whoa, or like seeing seeing your expression in the corner of my screen was really nice. You were like, whoa, cool. Um, I think that's the best way to connect with people. I, I'm very empathetic. I, I like to, um, see people's reactions and feel how they're feeling. So I think my favorite thing to do is to give talks like this one um, to be able to engage with people for real. Fantastic. And by the way, as much as we love doing digital education, there's something very special about being in person with people. That sort of reaction that you get that is much more tangible and, and you know immediate uh, live is a really, really nice thing. So great answer. So long story short is that your favorite thing about your job is everything that you mentioned. There you go. So sort of <laughs> yeah. Going it. out there and actually talking to people. Nice. 
Um, all right, you, you have a huge love of books. And as you can tell from behind me, like I have a huge <laughs> love of books too, books are the best. Now, Norman Doidge, uh, How the Brain Changes Itself is fantastic. Are there any books you've read lately in the last you know, few months that really jump out as being really exceptional? Oh, this is a very good question. Hmm. There's a book that I read last year that really captivated me. It's called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Yes. It's very, maybe you've heard of it. It's very, sounds very long. I mean, maybe you have it, um, yeah. but it, yeah. And in the book, uh, the, the title doesn't really give away what it's about if you don't know, um, but it's about uh, a, a woman who was it. Oh, we lost you for a second, Evie, I think. Let's get you back. Create a line of, to, to grow the first uh, cells in a dish that actually survived because before that cells would just am I still being hurt? Yeah. Disappeared for a second, but you're back. We got the little yeah. bit. Uh, the first group of cells grown in a dish came from cells. Yeah. Cell line. Yep. Go on. Exactly. So it was very fascinating because it not only told the really personal story of her and her family, but also kind of the the ethics of like should we be growing cells and who owns these cells if they're part of someone's body but now they're growing. So it's very fascinating. A really, it's a fantastic story. It's a beautiful science story. It's also a complicated ethical story in science, which is really rare. So it covers a lot of of ground. It's a great book. I, I can't recommend it enough either. Awesome. All right, Brian on YouTube wants to know, are there any science communicators or sites that you recommend for grades four through six or four through eight, basically? Uh, he's big on inquiry, usually outdoors, but it'd be great to tie in kids with the outside world more with some stuff that we can find online. Any sites you'd recommend? Oh, any websites for outdoor education? Hmm. I can't think off the top of my head for websites or resources, but I know on YouTube, there's a lot of cool uh, outdoor adventures. I know that the, uh, there's obviously things like SciShow and Crash Course, which have more education base, um, but some of their similar channels, like kind of under the same umbrella, they have like Animal Wonders, which is learning about different animals. Um, and they, some of their adventures are outdoors. Um, another great one is the Brain Scoop, which is uh, in a museum. Yeah, so there's, if you, look on YouTube and you watch a couple videos, I'm sure more will rec get recommended in your side channel um, that have people going out there and doing really cool adventures. Yeah, the Brain Scoop's Emily Grassley. She's incredible, yeah. really great nature stuff. Um, Science Sam, who you sort of referenced some of the stuff that she's been doing with COVID. Um, she's amazing. Who else? Just in general, actually check out our SciComm Storytime list of science communicators. Yeah. A lot of those people are doing some of the very best stuff on the web. So that's a, a great way to find out a lot of uh, neat stuff. Yeah. All right, Evie, uh, brains, obviously of huge interest to you, but as you've been seeking more and more science stories and learning more about, you know, different topics, is there anything else that's either really surprised you or jumped out as being something just exceptionally fascinating that you love to share? Oh, like a fun, fun fact or a fun field? It could be a fact, but more like a field. Like, is there something where, you know, you went into this and you learned that, wow, planetary science is really mind-blowing or, or anything specific? Really cool. I think I have been trying to get outdoors more and in the past couple of years, trying to explore that kind of aspect. I think with a studying the brain, I don't, I didn't get to go outside for my science. I didn't get to go out into the field. And, and so I'm very fascinated by kind of field research, especially things like biology uh, and paleontology, where they're, you know, digging up bones or studying kind of the different um, like plant and animal life. Um, so I've been following a lot of people who do that kind of work and maybe in the future, I'll be able to go out into the field. Um, awesome. yeah. well, and we'll happily do a session with you when you do. Um, we, we love nature here. We've got a chance to, um, Mallory Lindsay came on with us in our SciComm story time. She focused on weird and wonderful creatures and she did a whole talk on leeches, which is really cool. So uh, get out there in nature. In fact, we just finished up our biodiversity festival. So backyard bio and Edie, we'd love your pick for this. Just go in your backyard, take some pictures of some cool wildlife, share that with us. And we'd love to highlight as many of those from around the world as possible. Just that. Yes. I'll plug while we can. <laughs> All right. Um, fantasy books and sci-fi. I'm going to harp on books a little bit here because it's always such a huge part of your life. Fantasy and sci-fi are so neat because they portray these other worlds, these other conceptions of how the world could be or, or totally outlandish versions or got mythical creatures and all sorts of stuff. Why is that so important when it comes to science? It seems that a lot of scientists we bring on have a love of this kind of literature. And do you think, like, I certainly think there's a connection there, uh, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on why that sort of inspiration leads to some, you know, you know, interest in inquiry in, in the real world around us. Yeah, of course. I think it's very... Uh, that science and fantasy, science fiction and fantasy are a great way to tackle, to see what a technology can do in a society level. So scientists obviously create 
create things in the lab and they build things and they make discoveries. But outside of the lab, what impact is that going to have? Like, let's say we can make humans shoot electricity out of their hands. Like, that's science fiction. That's weird. But also, how is that going to impact society? Like, how are we going to change our laws? How are we going to have rules around that? How are we going to stay safe? Or if we can go to the moon, like, are people going to start living on the moon? How do we live on the moon? So there's all these kind of societal cascades and so the thing i love about fantasy and science fiction is it shows how it affects people's relationships or people's families or people's homes and if we're inventing something we need to consider that and so sci-fi is a place that scientists can actually turn and consider what impact their technology could have books we've been highlighting are there any movies so for me jurassic park and pretty much every paleontologist in the world uh, that's like you know 25 to 50 was like yes jurassic park is what did it <laughs> are there movies that really jump out to you as being you know fantastic depictions of science fiction things that people can go to and go wow that's fascinating in a blockbuster style way where i've learned a lot and i'm also yeah yeah unfortunately sometimes movies get it wrong so they're not always yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's so sometimes you watch a movie and you're like, hmm, like uh, people always talk about how Indiana Jones like actually destroys everything he touches, so that's not a good archaeologist. Um, but a really scientifically accurate book and movie that's very fascinating is The Martian. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's been heralded as like one of the most like actually accurate science fiction books ever. Uh, so there's a lot of details. So that's a really cool one. Um, yeah, I feel like I don't watch it as many movies as I should, but The Martian is one that I read and I watched and I was like, this is actually exploring what this would be like. In a it's the greatest advertisement for engineering a degree of all time. Like, it's like, whoa, exactly. what I can do. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so we, we talked about science topics like the atom, which are totally uncontroversial. Uh, the brain, everyone likes the brain, everyone's the human brain. <laughs> Now, when it comes to sharing things like vaccines, like GMOs, like climate change, where for whatever reason, there's a section of the population that is vehemently opposed to this, how do you deal with that personally when you're, when you're doing public talks or presentations? Yeah, that's a really good question. And a lot of what, uh, like I'm wrapping up my science, uh, science communication master's program right now. So I'm working with several science communicators, uh, like my classmates and I are all tackling different issues. And some of my friends are actually studying uh, vaccines and people's reasons for being hesitant. Um, and what we've learned is that there's a lot of uh, mistrust in science, right? Because to, as much as it might seem like science is objective and there's no doubt about it, um, there, there can be mistrust, right? Like if, if a politician makes uh, laws that are not helpful um, or harmful, then you could lose trust in politicians. And similarly, if, a sci if science or medicine is not um, has, has in some way hurt you or not helped your, you or your family, you can feel left out or you can feel lack of trust. Um, so it's important to have that empathy and understand where people are coming from because it's easy to say people who think climate change is, isn't real, they're like, how dare they? They don't know anything, right? Whatever. But it, it's, uh, that will just turn people away. So in science communication, we work on having empathy, understanding where people are coming from, um, and also not be like mean or uh, like uh, sarcastic or like ha, those people that don't know anything. Like uh, it's important to bring people in rather than uh, to push them away. Uh, so it's important to know why people might be losing trust in, in science and in the end, people are usually good, good natured and looking out for themselves. Right. Um, so, it, uh, yeah. So, lots of different uh, science communicators are working to tackle misinformation specifically, and I think that's why we need science communicators because scientists might not have this kind of training or understanding and might um, be like, "Oh, why don't they know that?" Um, so, it's science communicators who are trained to like have empathy and understanding of these different groups can be really effective at reaching out to them. Nice. What a beautiful answer. Thanks, Evie. All right. You know what? We're getting near the end of the session here. And the Young family in Oregon, they've been joining us for like dozens of our sessions over the last few weeks. So hi to the Young family. Uh, they always ask the question of, of what's your favorite part of your job. We've covered that. So I think I'll ask a question they would approve of, uh, which is where would you like to see yourself? Uh, you know, as a science communicator, there's not a huge variety of roles that are sort of uh, built in around the world for this program. So a lot of science communicators end up creating their own jobs. So whether it's that or an organization or, or group that you'd love to work with, is there a place that you'd really like to, you know, get to share your skills and then do some neat stuff? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, like I said, my favorite thing is to actually go out there and talk to people. Um, so there's this dream I've had for a long time that um, is like a long-term thing that might happen in the future, um, is to have my own science TV show. And that way I get to talk to different people um, and be inspired and like inspire 
kids around the world. I think in addition to reading books, I watched some science TV shows like Zaboomafu, which is like uh, the, these, these two brothers who would go around the world and learning about animals. And I found out that they're actually zoologists. Like they're not just actors. They're, they actually have uh, knowledge of science. Uh, so that's a big dream of mine. If I could have a TV show or be on a TV show where I'm talking to people and sharing science around the world. Nice. Well, we certainly hope that for you. You certainly have the enthusiasm in spades, Edie. And uh, yeah, we'd love to feature more stories in the, in the future. Hopefully you get a chance to get out in nature soon and do that, you know, what we were talking about a little earlier. All yeah, right. I'll find some birds. Awesome. Um, well, Edie, thank you so much for joining us today. Any last message you want to share with people tuning in uh, before we wrap up? I think that's it. Just get out there, stay curious, and keep exploring. It's amazing how many people we brought on that have stay curious is something that's really important. I, I love that. Oh, no, really? But I, I truly love that message. You know, whether it's books or movies, whatever interests you, there's so many resources out there and available now. So get out, explore, get inspired by people like Evie, and uh, hopefully we'll have you guys on the broadcast on in the future. For now, I'll wrap it up. Thank you very much to everyone for tuning in. Thank you so, so much for joining us, Evie, and we really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Have a nice day, everyone. Bye for now, guys.